name is Kim Schoen, and I'm the artist who made the work Baragua that I'm standing in front of, and I'm at the Edith Roos House in the exhibition Language for Sale, and I'll be talking to you a little bit about this work. The project began, I guess, when I was living in Los Angeles, and I was, um, I had a studio in Chinatown for many years, and I would always walk by the store, and it was the corner where the freeway kind of dumped you out into Chinatown. And it had an unusual architecture. It reminded me, with its curved windows, of a kind of 1980s version of the Musée d'Orsay or something. And it was filled with sculptures and statues of all types. And I would always wander around and kind of poke in and was very curious about it. It was really a kind of a wild assortment of every art historical period. And they were all crammed in there together. And this, this place kind of captured my imagination. I thought, what are all these things doing together? And it's really only the lingua franca, let's say, of commerce, or um, this idea that it's a store. So of course all these things can go together in a store um, without question that I wanted to question. And I started the project by reaching out to an art historian who was at the time working at the Getty Museum and asking if he would be interested in working on this project with me to develop a kind of provenance for all of these um, statues for sale at this store, which was called Los Angeles Stones and Gifts. And luckily he said yes. It was a sort of absurd endeavor, which um, I guess appealed to him in some way, because really... It's only the sort of morphological resemblances and an imagined history that one could put together. But using his expertise as an art historian was um, a kind of entry point and a door to a depth of knowledge that he could make associations and, for, you know, free associate what influences and histories these sculptures might have and how they ended up coming to look the way they did. Ils répandent la vie des corolles de vin à travers le cavalier The languages um, or the approximated languages used have been determined by the provenance um, that the art historian worked on and we decided for each sculpture of a country of origin, a most likely country of origin um, for each one, and the language spoken has to do with that time and place. So the room tone has a frequency in the piece. Each sculpture has a frequency, even if it doesn't have a voice. And this line between babble and noise and speech is being played with in the piece quite a bit. <laughs> Whether or not we make sense of each language is, um, I guess, uh, not clear um, because the languages are constructed to be approximate in so many different kinds of ways to sound as if it was Italian or as if it was um, French and sometimes the syllables like in the English don't even line up to be English words but the cadence or the sound is that of English so all of them are approximating language in varying ways and um, that mimics the way in which the sculptures were formed. They're approximating a certain genre or a certain icon or a certain movement or a certain idea and they're kind of copies of copies of copies and this kind of echo of an original is um, bouncing around in the piece as a whole, I think, these echoes of some kind of point of origin that is pretty much unknown. Oh, 
this border or beak like this? I've been immersed in some pretty strange languages in my life. Um, I've worked commercially, which puts one in a position to, of course, if you're listening, encounter a lot of nonsense. But my real work began on the subject when I first heard Sarah Palin speak when she was um, a candidate for vice president. Something really struck me, which was that um, this is the first time we're hearing somebody speak on the national stage who has no idea what they're saying and is, quote, speaking without meaning, I would say. And this really uh, grabbed my attention. I thought, something is shifting. Um, and I started experimenting around with this idea of speaking without meaning. Improvisational speech is um, best left to the professionals, but <laughs> theater actors, comedians, and that's generally who I work with when I, I cast for these videos, some of which can be seen in the exhibition language for sale, like the horseshoe effect and consider this scrimmage. I like to work with people who can try to... Um, work against sense. And for that, you need several qualities. You need a deep bench. Um, you need to be able to draw from your history. You need to be able to be nimble with your tongue and your thoughts and put things out there. And at the same time, scramble meaning, which is difficult because our tendency is to try to make sense, not to not make sense. Without great horizons on the corner, we don't have the necessary tools to find ourselves beyond the point that we're at currently. But it's hard to empty out meaning as one speaks because our tendency is to um, synthesize, to put together, to try and force sense out of literally anything we get. Um, so as an experiment, as an artist, I thought, oh, this will be fun um, to see what happens. I really didn't know. And that's why I like working with video, because it records thought in action. You get to see thought unfold. The labor is very present because um, it's not scripted and it's happening in the moment, so things can go any which way. And that constant sense of invention is preserved in the videos, I think, um, in some way. I mean, Banff was, was first thought of as a, a region of incredible uh, jealousy. It was a region of development, but it was also a a jam, a jelly, a preserve. You know, votes were not won in the last election by standing around chewing your fingernails. It was won by going out there, greeting the people, answering the questions at the sharp end of the boat. And Baraguan stem from this sort of ground of experimental works that I've been doing for the last 10 years. And I wanted to try something different with Baragua, and I'm grateful to the Edith Roos House for giving me the stipend so I could do so. I think what we're immersed in culturally, um, politically certainly, on occasion, is this missense or almost sense, and tracing that is a kind of mission of mine. Um, reflecting that and also inventing it along the way. Feast had no manufacturing, yes, feared. I really feel that like this approximate speech is um, an interesting, volatile ground to play with as an artist, for sure, because artists have the power to create sense and move sense around. Earnestly enjoyed. I feel excited as an artist to work with sense making because sense is more like an atmosphere. It incorporates many factors, meaning being one of them. Um, 
And so, yeah, Baraguan has a lot to do with this sounding like sense. And the sculptures and statues that looked like other sculptures was the impetus for that. And this kind of loose conglomeration of associations and this cloud of references has a lot to do with the approximate use of things as a shorthand and as they get condensed and shared and condensed and shared um, there's something essential that remains perhaps but it mutates along the way so this idea of language mutating and as it approximates is of interest to me The photographs that are in the exhibition, um, they're stills from the video and vertical pans. I did those pans down in large part to give to the art historian to describe the sculptures in more detail so he could see their full figures, even though obviously the composition is a horizontal one in the video. Um, I wanted the art historian to be able to take in all of the properties of each sculpture. So there are four still stacked upon one another um, in the exhibition as a sort of trace or record of the process that I used to share the work. There are also two single stills in the exhibition, one of The Temptation of Eve um, and one of the thinker, which is the only sculpture in the entire video that has an actual definite provenance to it. Um, and I thought those two had some sort of symbolic reference to the show as a whole, the price tag on the temptation of Eve and the thinker in the dimly lit fluorescent space. There is also an actual sculpture in the exhibition, which is on loan from Slink, which is a garden supply store in Oldenburg. I think her presence in the space as a commercial product in a museum environment operates in some way in relation to the video because it's a more tangible physical presence of um, what these products literally are. In my practice, I try to take a longer look at um, commercial objects and products as the things that they are. They're stand-ins for what we want, what we hope for, what our fantasies, desires are. And as such, I think they contain a lot. And um, I tend to gravitate towards background objects or objects that are there to support a kind of mise-en-scene in our lives, and these garden statuaries to me were that. You know, what they embody for me is a record or a trace of many influences, which is why I think the piece turned out in the way that it did, because it's tracing such a complicated, complex history of influences, such an idiosyncratic agglutination of influences and um, that's what I get attached to like somebody made these somebody made strange choices while making these somebody's life influenced the way these look and that all gets compressed and condensed into what a an, an anonymous product for sale is in one of these stores you don't know the history of the making but I tried to intuit that or reconstruct it in some way because there are a lot of histories embedded in these commercial objects and a lot of voices trapped in them. <laughs>